Hi, this is Mark Birch with quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. Hi, so today I'm going to be focusing on the sun rising. And in terms of its form, it's twofold. First of all, it's a dramatic monologue uh, because the poetic voice addresses the sun directly. And secondly, it's an obeyed, a poem that focuses on the separation of lovers at dawn. But this is an unconventional obeyed because rather than focusing on the sorrow that that parting might generate, Dunn resists the parting and instead tells the sun to focus on the lovers. So let's take a look at the poem itself. Busy old fool, unruly son, why dost thou thus through windows and through curtains call on us? Must tell thy motions love as seasons run? Saucy pedantic wretch, go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will ride. Call country ants to harvest offices. Love, all alike, no season knows nor clime, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. Thy beams so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long. If her eyes have not blinded thine, look, and tomorrow late, tell me whether both the Indias of spice and mine be where thou hast left them, or lie here with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, and thou shalt hear all here in one bed lay. She's all states. And all princes I, nothing else is. Princes do but players, compared to this all honours mimic all wealth alchemy. Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, well, that's done in warming us. Shine here to us, and thou art everywhere. This bed thy centre is, these walls thy sphere. So Dunn's addressing the sun directly, as you'd expect in a dramatic monologue. Uh, but this is also a form of rhetorical apostrophe um, where uh, someone addresses an object, essentially. Rather than elevating the sun as a kind of powerful celestial force, as would be conventional, and which Dunn does on a number of other occasions, he degrades it and abuses it. So the sun, first of all, is personified as a fool. Um, that fool is modified three times within the first line. Busy, old fool, unruly son. So we've got busy, old and unruly, all of which have negative connotations. It's busy, so that's an Elizabethan synonym for interfering, uh, which we'd maybe still use today in the context of busybody. It's also old, in contrast to the young lovers. And finally, it's unruly, in the sense of not behaving appropriately, disturbing the lovers. Dunn challenges the sun regarding its motives for disturbing the lovers. It's presented as an unwelcome and voyeuristic intruder who spies on them through windows and curtains. And that syntactic parallelism through windows and through curtains creates a sense of the intrusive ubiquitous nature of the sun, given that the line includes both repetition and the balance that comes from syntactic parallelism, which connects the clauses, giving a sense of the universal nature of this intrusion. Must to thy motions lovers seasons run, um, relies on the way in which the sun represents time in the sense that its movement regulates the passage of time. So Dunn questions whether the time that regulates lovers should be subject to the sun. That word run conveys the sense of urgency that the motion of the sun creates. Um, it shouldn't be ascribed to the lovers. There's no need for them to be urgent and rushing. Time for the other lovers isn't measured in seconds, minutes or hours, but seasons. So in other words, lover's time should be long and unhurried, um, developed over a long period of time. So as Dunn begins the first line of the second quatrain, he returns to the sentiments that he expressed in the first line of the first quatrain. There, if you remember, he began with a clause in which you had a pejorative noun pre-modified with two negative adjectives, busy old fool. And the same structure is applied here saucy pedantic wretch once again he's debasing and abusing the sun it's personified in that with that pejorative noun wretch or an unfortunate person 
The portrayal of the sun as a busybody is replicated in the use of the word pedantic. It's portrayed as focusing on details that shouldn't concern it, the behaviour of the lovers. And that's why it's saucy, a word that by the 16th century basically meant impertinent. And this impertinence and the disdain for the sun is communicated partly through the use of hard consonant sounds. We've got things like the d, the t and the ch, all of which give that sense of harshness, uh, representing the bitterness of the poetic voice towards the sun. The sun's told to perform other duties, to tell off late schoolboys and sour apprentices. And those are the kinds of people who would maybe need the sun to regulate their day, unlike the lovers. Uh, apprentices are the apprentices who worked in uh, an assortment of trades across London and the country as a whole. Uh, they worked long hours, low paid, and uh, it was years before those apprenticeships were completed. They had a reputation for being lazy and uh, disobedient and um, annoying and frustrating, and so would therefore need the services of the sun potentially in order to rouse them. Dunn commands the sun to bother all aspects of society rather than him and his lover. Uh, King James was renowned as loving to hunt, and those hunts would usually take place at dawn, so the sun would be best served by being with the hunt, waking up the huntsman. And in contrast, some of the lowest members of society would also be governed by the sun, farm labourers. Um, it could be argued that the labourers are rendered low status here through the zoomorphic representation of them as ants. It's also possible, of course, that Dunn's literally referring to ants. In both cases, what you've got is this kind of polarisation of society between the highest echelons of society and the lowest, whether that lowest are farm labourers or going down into the animal kingdom with ants. You've got this broad spread of things that would benefit from being served by the sun, all things other than the lovers. So Dunn's use of uh, imperatives illustrates his sense of authority over the sun, that he's more powerful than the sun. So we've got go, go, call. He presents himself as having power over the sun, and he's the one that's directing it to attend those that might need its services. And as in many of his other poems, Dunn asserts that love exists beyond time. And as a result of that, it's, it's unchanging, or as he expresses it here, all alike. It's not subject to the demands of the changing seasons or changing weather, what he's referred to here as clime. So smaller units of time are presented through this asyndetic list, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. And that helps to convey the endless and endlessly frustrating attempts by the sun to delineate and control life. The metaphor rags of time may represent the way in which these units of time have been torn from the less abstract season. Uh, hours, days, months are pretty small and meaningless units in the same way that a rag is a small and relatively meaningless thing that's come from a broader piece of fabric. And so rags also connote something dirty and worthless. And metaphorically, perhaps that's the case because those, again, units of time are repeated endlessly to no real purpose. If they're not governed by love, if they're not within the scope of love and love is universal and great, then they're pretty points, pointless, like a rag. OK, thanks. Um, I hope you'll join me for the second part of uh, the analysis and take care. Cheers. Bye.